Welcome to the 2021 Earth Science Week webinar series, Water Today and for the Future. We are pleased to have four outstanding professionals that work with issues of water in human society. Today's lecture is Water Supply Issues in the Delaware River System, a tale of tunnels, transfers, tumult, and trout. Our speaker is Dr. David Wunsch, who is both the Director and State Geologist of the Delaware Geological Survey and past president of the American Geosciences Institute. Welcome everyone. As you can see from the title of my talk today, Water Supply Issues in the Delaware River System, a tale of tunnels, transfers, tumult, and trout. And what that refers to, the first part of tunnels, we're gonna talk about New York City's water supply and the amazing engineering marvel that actually trans transfers water from freshwater lakes in the Catskills all the way down to New York City. Transfers refers to water that is being transferred between basins from the Delaware River over to the Hudson drainage. Tumult is related to some of the legal challenges that have come up with uh, sharing water, so to speak, out of the Delaware River Basin and trout kind of refers to some of the varied interests that have evolved with time related to water in the river and how that complicates uh, issues as far as having reservoirs for water supply. Today's presentation, I'm gonna cover a introduction and history about the Delaware River Basin and the, and the basin's contribution to New York City's water supply and some of the system management flow and allocation issues and we'll also talk about some current system problems related to the geology and the engineering aspects of this amazing tunnel system. And we'll actually get a virtual tour of the water supply tunnel. Um, not many people get a chance to go down inside and see some of the uh, construction that's going on. And we'll also discuss water management policy issues. And lastly, talk about an agreement that was signed that helps deal with water management for the Delaware River Basin. Well, you're probably wondering what does a picture of pizza have to do with a, a water uh, presentation? And it's, I'll tell you a little story about this. I grew up in upstate New York and um, I went to work at the Kentucky Geological Survey earlier in my career. And there was another fellow there who was from New York City. And we both liked to cook and we would trade recipes for making homemade pizza and we both struggle to find a way to or the right recipe, the right mixture to make kind of a New York style pizza crust that was thin and, and just just something that uh, I think a lot of people find desirable about New York style pizza. But with all the different ways we tried to modify, we could just never quite get it right. And my buddy finally said, it's got to be the water. And there may be some truth to that because New York City being a large metropolitan area really surrounding the city has one of the, the best, the highest quality water supplies in the world. And we'll go through that and, and develop a little bit about how that came to be. So the image on the left is the Delaware River Basin, and it shows uh, in white here where it extends from really kind of upstate New York in the Catskill regions. It goes and encapsulates part of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and then gets into Delaware here. Uh, we are the namesake, of course, and then the river flowing from the various tributaries to the main stem, and then it empties out into the Delaware Bay. And uh, often on the right-hand side, you can see one of the reservoirs we're talking about that New York City constructed to you know, dam up and store water for water supply. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, New York City is often cited as having the best water supply of any major city in the world. Um, there are also some interbasin diversions where uh, water from the Delaware River Basin is diverted out of the basin to New York City as well as New Jersey. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So a little bit of history regarding the New York City water supply. And New York City will play a, a big role in this because they are the, the big gorilla in the room, so to speak, on some of the uh, negotiations that we'll talk about that are related to some of the lawsuits that were filed uh, related to New York City using some of the water out of the basin. But early New York City, the settlement relied largely on groundwater, believe it or not, from very shallow wells that were dug. And over time, you know, overuse as the city grew, as well as contamination of those supplies, 
they uh, use the Croton River Reservoir, which is constructed in Westchester County, north of the city in 1842. The city kept growing and then they put in a second reservoir system and an aqueduct, which refers to kind of a masonry uh, pipe or similar to what the Romans did if you're a, a student of history. And uh, they made these kind of brick masonry channels that they could divert water and carry it a long way to where they needed it. Well, in 1928, the New York City Board of Water Supply approved uh, the building and, and funding of reservoirs in the Delaware River tributaries, which is roughly 80, 100 miles away, depending on where you are. So that's that's a long ways away to get your water. In any regard, um, New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, objected to that and took New York City to the and it was all the way to the Supreme Court, and it dealt with them them taking water out of the river because. You know, that flows through parts of uh, New Jersey as well, and they had needs and uses for it. But the Supreme Court upheld New York City's right to augment its supply. Um, then in 1954, New York City petitioned the court to divert additional water out of Delaware River Basin. And this became a bigger issue and involved the states of Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, which are essentially the states that are uh, within, or parts of them are within the Delaware River Basin. And New York City, of course, was one of the parties to this. And um, the, the parties that were uh, subject or influenced this court were called the decree parties, and each one has a designated principal or a person that represents the interests of that state. Anyway, the court case allowed New York City to divert 800 million gallons per day, which is a lot of water. And also in this court ruling, it also allowed New Jersey to divert 100 million gallons a day. But however, to keep some checks and balances so the city didn't um, get too much water and take too much or make too much stress on the, the river system, they had to uh, release water from their dams to maintain 1,750 cubic feet per second over a stream gauge or, or a small dam where that's used to measure the water flow, and you can tell how much water is flowing over it. Um, then it, the decree also stated that modifications to this decree are only possible with the unanimous consent of all the parties. Now here becomes the sticking point because unanimous consent, meaning all parties have to agree to any changes, is very difficult to do. Uh, speaking of my pizza earlier in the slideshow, it's hard to get five people to agree what to put on a pizza, let alone agree to major changes in the amount of water that can be diverted and, and when and, and things of that nature. So the hydrology gets very complicated and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The decree also uh, instituted a special river master. This is a, a person, so to speak, but also a, a group of staff that work for them. And that's established through the U.S. Geological Survey. And the river master kind of rides herd and watches to make sure the releases that New York City makes are in uh, uh, are consistent with what the decree defined, and also you know meets with the other decree parties to to make sure you know any any issues that are being brought up are are dealt with. And uh, this decree also established a Delaware River Advisory Committee, which are a committee form of the principals, which are, you know, a person, and basically the principals are the governors of the states of Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and a representative from New York City. So here's a website screen grab of the USGS uh, Delaware River Master site, and it talks a little bit about the historical background. I know it's hard to read, and we won't go over too much of that, but just some of the uh, statutes are down here below that are in Delaware statutes about uh, the decree and how we have to pay for that. Basically, all the states have to contribute and pay for the, the office of the special river master. And um, lastly, the decree also, or I'm sorry, the legislation states that the state geologist, which is what my role is in Delaware, shall serve as a representative to the state, to the river master of the Delaware River in accordance to the decree. You may wonder, why is the state geologist assigned to this? Um, for the other states, it's typically uh, one of the commissioners from their environmental or, or their water divisions. But in our case, um, the, the water that flows down the river, it was feared that if, if too much water is being diverted out, the water is going to get saltier and saltier by the time it gets to the Delaware Bay. And Delaware is one of the lowest lying states in the country. 
our mean elevation is only about 40 feet above sea level. So there was great fear even uh, several decades ago that if the water gets saltier in the bay, it could affect the shallow groundwater and agriculture was a big part of our industry in Southern Delaware. And so there was fears about the salinity increasing and, and really affecting our agriculture. Well, anyway, the state geologist at that time actually was one of the witnesses called before the Supreme Court during this time and successfully defended Delaware's position. So ever since the state geologist has been the degree party principal. And so thus my role on this body. Now the decree parties um, and the River Master Advisory Committee, not to be confused with the Delaware River Basin Commission. You may have heard that term if you're from any area or from around the area here in the Northeast. And this is a special uh, body that was chartered in 1961, um, put together and signed by John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy. And uh, this body, kind of deals with permitting and water withdrawals and, and uh, permits for discharges into the river basin. And um, it's interesting in that it has dual authority in that uh, if you want to file for a withdrawal from the Delaware River, for example, in New Jersey or Delaware, uh, you have to file for a permit within your state, but you also have to submit a, a duplicate permit to the Delaware River Basin Commission. So. Um, these are some of the controls that kind of cross boundaries to make sure the water is allocated properly and in water quality conditions. So they're dealing more with permits and kind of point of use where the Delaware River uh, Decree Party is really dealing more with the, the water diversions and how much New York City has to put in. So here's just kind of a summary of that where the River Master Office uh, is the master over the Delaware River and it administers the, the parts of the decree Whereas the Delaware River Basin is a federal interstate compact, or I'm sorry, the River Basin Commission is a compact and it has members from these various states. It also has a member from the US, US Corps of Engineers. And that's a little bit different that we do not have that membership on ours. So the membership is not exactly identical between these two bodies. So in the 1960s, we had the drought of record. Anybody old enough to remember that, it was a big deal where New York City had to really tighten up and ration the amount of water. It affected, you know, not only New York City, but a lot of the Northeast. I was a young child at that time. But the, um, the drought of record uh, had the flow in the river the lowest it had been in, in, uh, in recordable times. And the, the safe yield water was uh, availability was reduced significantly. Um, as a result of that, the decree parties signed something called the Good Faith Agreement in 1983, where the Supreme Court allowed us to make changes to the original decree. Everybody got on board and, and made some changes that allowed a little bit more flexibility to how much water can be diverted and when to, uh, to kind of save water and manage it better for, for droughts that were coming ahead. And um, as I said, there was more flexibility to deal with drought mainly and uh, other components could be changed over time. And so this was in effect till very recently. Now let's talk a little bit about the Delaware Aqueduct as I mentioned earlier in my talk. This is a series of mainly tunnels that diverts water from these reservoirs that were built in upstate New York. The uh, continuous line of tunnels is 85 miles long, which makes it the world's longest continuous tunnel. A lot of people don't realize that. I think if you divide it in half, each half is still the longest, uh, first and second longest uh, tunnels in the world. And it conveys water um, from the reservoirs down into the Hudson drainage. And um, you can see the different sections of it here. And, and it's pointed to the, it was built in sections. And here's a picture of a guy standing there for a little bit of scale when the tunnels are being developed. And here's a cross section of where the tunnels pass from up in the Catskills and it goes down from you know, as shallow as like 600 feet up to 2,400 feet below the surface. And it has a series of vertical access points too for maintenance and uh, for just controlling the pressure and, and the water moving down. Um, but it's interesting, the tunnel actually passes below the Hudson River. A lot of people have asked, why didn't New York City just simply draw water from the Hudson River? Well, that was uh, a river that was widely used in early times in U.S. history, and it became very polluted. And uh, 
a lot of shipping things going on there. So New York City was constantly trying to find fresh water that they could protect and these reservoirs being in kind of rural upstate seemed to be the best option. Now, what were some of the costs? Well, obviously it cost money to build this tunnel and, and uh, reservoir system. It was on the order of several hundreds of millions of dollars, which in today's world doesn't seem like that much when we're talking about trillions, but at the time it was very significant. 58 lives were lost also in the construction of this, mainly in the tunneling. Um, and also there's some continuing maintenance issues that are continuing to cost money. We'll talk a little bit about that with the, the one the repair job that's going on right now. But uh, it's interesting when we're talking about lives lost in that the New York City tunnel project was operational through World War II, and it was the only major um, public works project that the government, the U.S. government, allowed the workers to continue to work on because during the war, almost all men of, of kind of young workable age were drafted for uh, the war effort. But this was such an important uh, project, and for there were so many people depending on its water supply that the workers were allowed to continue working through World War II. Other things here of interest is uh, this little book I found in my archives from my predecessor state geologist that served on the uh, decree party group. But anyway, it, it talks about some of the small towns that um, were actually flooded by the dams and reservoirs that were created. That's something I didn't realize, but there was a lot of people relocated. For example, here you can see there were four villages submerged for the Pacton Reservoir and uh, 943 people were displaced. Uh, 10 cemeteries were moved. Uh, I grew up in Western New York where the Kinzua Dam um, displaced the Seneca Nation of Indians. And that was a, a real big deal. And when I was growing up as a young man, but I didn't realize in the Eastern part of New York State, this also had happened from the, the New York City Reservoir build out. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the tunnels and some of the issues going on right now. We're looking in the red here is the uh, Round Out West Branch Tunnel, and that's the section that kind of goes underneath the Hudson River. It was last drained in 1958, and uh, it's a critical component because the, the Delaware system now up here basically supplies about 50% of New York City's water supply. Um, the tunnel in this section is 45 uh, miles long and it's 13 and a half foot in diameter. As I mentioned, it can go up to uh, 2,400 feet below the ground surface. Now, one of the issues that's popped up recently is the tunnel is starting to leak. It's had a couple of major leakage areas that are leaking one spot 15 million gallons per day and another 35 million gallons per day. That's a lot of water. And uh, it came out by two small towns and um, you might ask, well, how do you, well, let's first look at the uh, cross section here. You can see the, this is the level of the water that rises in the tunnel and um, it slopes down from the highlands and the Catskills down toward New York City. So there is enough uh, slope or gradient that the tunnels will flow by gravity by themselves. Uh, the lowest point in the tunnel is right below the Hudson River. And these are where some of these leak, one of the leak areas is. So this is what it looks like. Um, the level of the Hudson River right here. So even when you drain the tunnels, there's always a chance for water to be leaking down and continue to keep water inside of these shafts as work would be done to try to prepare some of the leaks. So how do you can how do you tell if a tunnel that could be, you know, half a mile under the ground is leaking? Well, one way is when water makes it to the surface and uh, shows you some behaviors that aren't normal. For example, there's a stream gauge, this, this small dam, so to speak, that uh, you can see a measuring stick that allows you to measure how much water and kind of directly, indirectly calculate how much water is flowing past this point. Well, this is when the tunnel was in operational mode and this is what 5 million gallons looks like flowing over this gauge, 5 million gallons per day. And then the tunnel shut down, uh, this is what it looks like in normal flow. So you can see how much it was augmented and when they started to see these flows picking up, they knew that the tunnel was leaking. Also, there were some homes nearby that their um, basements started to fill up with water as well. So it became a major deal and New York City was forced to address the, the leakage. So the project goal is to repair this tunnel and try to uh, uh, find some creative solutions to it to uh, get the tunnel done with the minimal tunnel outage 
because the, you know they need this water. Like I said, the uh, um, Delaware River Basin supply supplies New York City with about half of its water, so it's important to get this done with the least uh, impact to the water supply. Some of you may ask, why doesn't New York City use the Catskill system? And the reason for that, it has to do with water quality issues. For example, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you can see one of the New York City reservoirs with some rather cloudy, pinkish tinted water. And that is because of the geology. Um, believe it or not, the geology changes within the Catskill system as you go from about Bingham to New York and east. Uh, west of there, the, the rocks in the Delaware system are kind of a gray colored. But as you go east, and if you can see this, if you ever travel Route 86 or 88 in uh, upstate New York, that uh, the road cuts there, the, you can see the rocks have kind of a pinkish uh, color to them. And that's because the iron inside has been oxidized and gives them that color. But anyway, runoff that comes from water flowing over these types of rocks and into these reservoirs will pick up that pinkish hue and uh, it gets caught into the water. And it, it's, of course, it's very expensive to treat that and make it clean for drinking water. So that's why the Delaware system is much more preferred for its high quality of water. This slide shows a bypass that's being projected to repair the current leaking system of the tunnel. One of the leaks in the tunnel system is just on the west side of the Hudson River, and this bypass tunnel will be drilled to go around that section of tunnel and then ultimately connected into it where they can turn off the water flowing through the existing tunnel and route it through the bypass tunnel. Here for the geologists in the crowd, we can see where the geology impacts the problems that we're, we're talking about here. Uh, this is kind of a grainy uh, vision of a geologic map, but basically this orangey section here is the Wappinger limestone. And you've got limestone basically right near the Hudson River, and you also have some faulting or cracks in the rock. And faults in limestone near a water supply is, is not usually a good thing, um, and you'll see a little bit why. Here's just some pictures from the field there where geologists are doing some mapping, but the fractures here are from the, the fault that occurs in this region. And the limestone, when water moves through it, limestone is a type of rock that can dissolve over time. And so you get these large vugs and in some places kind of karst uh, features and, and uh, solution along the fractures that, that allows a lot of water to move through that. And this is why it's creating some of the instability and the tunnel is collapsing and also allowing the water to, to seep up. So here's kind of a cross section again, and the, the new tunnel has to be about 700 and 1,750 feet away from the, the current reach, and it shows you where this uh, limestone is in the fault zone. So you may wonder, how do you fix and drill a new tunnel? Well, in the old days, they simply would have miners that would drill into the rock and at the front of the tunnel, put dynamite in and blast and keep removing the rocks, and then they would shore it up with timber and pump in concrete around it to build a round tunnel. More modern day, we use something called a tunnel boring machine, and that's what you're looking at here. This is a, a vertical egress down into the ground, and this round cylindrical thing you're looking at that looks like a farm silo is actually a machine, a tunnel boring machine that will grind out like a drill bit. Here's the, the bit on the front that will make a perfectly round tunnel this size. And here's a picture of the a tunnel boring machine that was actually created for the, this particular project. It was built in Ohio, totally constructed there, and then deconstructed so it could be transported and rebuilt in uh, New York City, or, or up, I'm sorry, upstate New York, near where they will lower it down to drill the new tunnel. Um, the conditions for tunneling, there's about 6,000 feet of it through this limestone, and this is going to be very difficult uh, uh, drilling or, or tunnel boring because you are in the limestone and it's also under high pressure from the Hudson River above. And so how are they going to do that? Well, here's kind of a schematic of this tunnel boring machine. Believe it or not, it's all hydraulics and the, the round thing spins around in front. There's actually uh, uh, operators sitting inside controlling this thing and they drill out in front of it and pump concrete or grout and they're basically going to be grouting in front, let it set up and continue to tunnel through. This is 
a very challenging uh, way to, to do a tunnel and probably pretty risky for the people working it. A tunnel this size and the kind of construction work, you gotta have specialized machinery. So here you can see some of the actual machines to transport equipment designed uh, with these kind of inclined wheels to run inside of a large diameter tunnel. This is kind of an interesting 3D view of what's gonna go on, but basically we're gonna drill this new tunnel around and then uh, create some what we call vertical tunnels, access tunnels with a sump or a low point where you can collect water. And then once this is all done, they can connect it into the existing tunnel and then repair the leaks here. Now this is a view I took from uh, a tour of the tunnel uh, construction that's going on now. And we're down about 800 feet in this vertical tunnel that's being uh, drilled down. And this is where all the equipment will be lowered down and access to create this new tunnel that will connect into the existing tunnel. Some more schematics of just what it looks like once it's done, there'll be a low area drilled or a bunch of pumps in there because even when you shut off the other tunnels, there's always water leaking in and to keep the tunnels dry, they have to set in some very large pumps to, to kind of manage the water they're expecting. Now, before they do all this work, they also have to inspect the tunnels to see the quality of the, 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 the tunnel itself and if there's any cracks and some of the infrastructure they'll have to deal with. So they send in autonomous underwater vehicles or basically drones that, that uh, act as mini submarines and have uh, high resolution cameras and other uh, gear on uh, inside the device that can record its way through the tunnel and report and give them a good idea what it looks like in advance of the work they're going to do. Now here's a picture of a section of the tunnel that was uh, drained out and you can see some workers in here scraping away and what they're doing is removing this biofilm that has built up over time along the tunnels. And uh, it's interesting that the biofilm actually affects the friction and, the, uh, and how freely the water can move through this. And so one of the things they're doing to kind of rehab that is, is power washing that and they're estimating you can give tens of millions of gallons per day additional capacity due to the loss of flow just from that biofilm. Some of the other uh, uh, things that New York City will be doing while they're doing this repair, they bought a well field in Queens, New York, at uh, groundwater wells that they're going to refurbish and get them pumping to kind of make up some of the supply they'll be losing when they uh, have to turn off the main tunnel for these repairs. And also conservation, which is interesting. They've saved over 50 million gallons per day. Uh, here's an interesting graphic in that regard. Here's the population of New York City. Um, and this shows in the blue line is the uh, demand, million gallons per day. Here's the drought of record I mentioned in the 60s. And so demand went way, way down. It had to because there was no, not enough water supply. But notice that uh, here in more recent times, the city of New York's uh, population has grown considerably. It's up at 8.2 million, but look at the demand has gone down to the lowest it's ever been. So this is all due to conservation measures. Um, you may have heard uh, our past president would uh, complain about shower heads in New York City and the lack of pressure. Well, that was one of the, uh, the, the ways they did is pr providing uh, funding and support for people to install these low pressure shower heads and, and toilets and things that would uh, help uh, to conserve water. And it was obviously very successful. Let's take a little tour inside some of the uh, inside infrastructure on the surface related to the, these tunnels. These large doors are so you can move large uh, gear in and out. Uh, here's just a picture of one of the command centers where they can actually by computer design and release water from these various dams to make up that flow that has to be maintained per the decree. Uh, down in some of the measuring gauges that we have farther downstream. Here's some of the valves that they're going to be installing with some of the, uh, the repair. And, and uh, it's just interesting, you know, everything is big for the Big Apple. And you can just see this wheel here to turn the valve is like the size of a small steering wheel. And that's how large some of these valves are that they're going to lower down and install. This is a picture of myself standing near a generator with all that water that we're talking about flowing through these tunnels. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of water energy, a lot of pressure being uh, guided through the tunnels. And, and uh, the city did take advantage of that by installing some generators. This one was installed, I think, in the 40s. And it's a, a very simple device. I always got a kick of uh, out of this little 
plaque on the side of it. I know you can't read the writing here, but it basically says if things are not going right, refer to the instruction manual, which uh, I guess in the day you could look at an instruction manual to figure out some very simple generator that looks like something you might have in a, in a model uh, for Tinker Toys or something like that. Nowadays, of course, these would all be computer generated, uh, computer operated, and, and lots of sensors and things. And behind me is the axle that has gone down to the turbines in the tunnel below, and this is spinning at about 400 RPMs. And what we're looking at here is when they're inside the tunnels, the way they access them to do work is through a series of, of doors. And these are bronze doors, bronze being an alloy that does not corrode easily. So the idea there that uh, these tunnels stay unopened for, for decades in some case, and you want something that's going to work when you want the door to open. But that being said, they're going to be opened and closed a lot during some of this construction. So they needed to go down and check the, uh, the, the shape of all of these doors and perhaps do some maintenance on them. And um, in order to maintain the water flow and, and for other reasons, this, a lot of this work had to be done underwater. And so what you're looking at here, uh, this global diving uh, painted on this long uh, tube here, this is actually living quarters for divers that go down and do uh, construction maintenance on the tunnel. This is a company that also does work like on some of the large floating one and uh, and that one's uh, oil and gas rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, that uh, may be moored to the to the ground or the uh, sea floor. Here's an up close picture of it, and uh, these little portals you can see the the men that are living inside. And the reason they are inside is because they are working down about 800 feet of fresh water, and this is some of the deepest fresh water repairs I think uh, on record in the world. And in order for these guys to go down and do their shifts, they can't keep coming out and decompressing. So they live under very high uh, pressures in the atmosphere that's made of helium and oxygen. So if you've ever heard people talk with the high squeaky voices with helium, that's what these guys talk like and they communicate. But they live in there for weeks at a time because it takes 72 hours to decompress from the pressure inside of this vessel to normal atmospheric pressure. Now this, uh, puts a lot of stress on these workers because if you were, for example, to come down with a, a stroke or some other serious medical injury, you're pretty much stuck in there for 72 hours until they can get you out. So you have to be in prime shape and it's, it takes a large toll on, on the people who work there, their bodies. So here's just a little look inside of what goes on to uh, manage these tunnels, but here's where they lower the workers down. There's a lot of infrastructure, everybody, has got hooks on to make sure if you slipped and fell, you don't fall down that long, deep access tunnel. And here's a picture of a device that we, uh, the workers are lowered down into the tunnel with. This, this bell basically attaches to the top of that uh, space shuttle looking living quarters I showed you, and they can seal it off and then the guys crawl in and out and then they lower it down into the, uh, the water down below where they come out of this and, and start to do their work. Here's just a picture of the inside of it. It looks sort of like a space shuttle or something of that, but these are designed to withstand several hundred uh, pounds per square inch of pressure. And here's some more of the infrastructure. You can see uh, one of the helmets that the guys wear, and you see there's just hoses and, and wires everywhere in this place. It was very uh, precarious to walk around and get a look. And what you're looking at here are all these sensors that are attached to these dive helmets and the dive suits of the workers. Because as I mentioned, the, uh, the severity of the conditions there, they have a, a person sitting in a control center that connect that is watching continuously all the workers down there. They have gauges that are looking at their oxygen content, their pulse, uh, other uh, factors related to our health, and they're monitored constantly when they're working down there. Now, let's go back up to the surface. We've talked about some of the repair going on in the tunnel and get back into some of the problems and issues related to water management in the Delaware River. And the river, like many of our rivers in the United States, is a river of competing uses. There's a lot of people that want to use it for recreation and maybe use for water supply, maybe using for water for cooling, uh, power plants, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit about something called a flexible flow management plan. But like every river, the Delaware River does flood. And so 
flooding, when it has occurred, a lot of the people that have been, you know, afflicted by this are wonder what is the role of these reservoirs? They put these dams here and some people will claim that their houses are flooded now more than they ever did before the dams were built. Okay, there are people who are concerned, as I've mentioned, about flooding of their properties on the river stem down below the reservoirs. There are some folks that claim that their houses have flooded more now since the reservoirs were built. Up above, uh, you can see a graphic that shows the water levels of the combined storage of the various reservoirs. And we follow this graph to see how much water should be in these reservoirs at different times of year. And so the flood people would like larger voids or to have New York City to reduce the volume that's in there that, so that could store more storm water when we do have large coastal storms, for example, coming up the coast. On the other side of the coin, you've got the fisheries that have developed there. Interestingly, these reservoirs were built in the in the upland areas and in the kind of where the streams were ephemeral. And so once the water was stored in these reservoirs, they released it out of the dams and it produces very cold water. And thus a fisheries was uh, developed there where they stocked for trout and they actually are very happy there. And it has a, an amazing trout fishing uh, game fish uh, industry in that part of the Delaware Basin. And of course, as time has gone on, the fishermen and, and some of the other vested groups want the, the dams to release cold water whenever it gets warm in the summertime. So they don't want um, the dams to hold back water for drought. They want it released at times for fishing. And that, of course, causes some issues because the, the Supreme Court decree that I mentioned earlier has to deal with water supply. The whole purpose of these reservoirs was for water supply. They were not designed, um, nor was it thought of at the time, that they would be used for supplying water for fisheries or storage to prevent floods. So this creates issues with uh, the public who have demands about what should be done with these reservoirs. Another issue, like I mentioned earlier, in the southern part of Delaware is a salinity issue. If more water is being stored or diverted out of the northern part of the basin, then the water is going to get saltier and saltier here, especially with sea level rise. As we know that sea level rises up, the tides will bring salt water farther and farther up. This graphic here shows you, uh, this is northern Delaware here, and this kind of shows the normal location of something called the salt front or the salt wedge. Basically, we monitor the stream and for the amount of chloride in it or indirectly the salt. And uh, the salt line is defined as where the, the chloride concentration is 250 milligrams per liter, which is roughly about where humans will start to taste the saltiness in water. And normally this oscillates depending on the time of year. If there's more fresh water coming down the river, it pushes the salt line farther south. And when it's dry in the summer, it moves back up this way. Well, during the drought of the 1960s, the drought of record that I've mentioned, the salt line went from its normal range all the way up to just a few miles south of Philadelphia. Now, this is a big deal because Philadelphia also draws its water out of the Delaware River for water supply, and that's another large city. So this was a huge potential threat to the water supply of Philadelphia. And um, so we've been monitoring this ever since, and it's become a big deal about how do we monitor and what can we do to make sure the salt line doesn't encroach up farther south if we ever have droughts that are equal to the drought of the 60s in the future. Now, as I mentioned before, we because of these varying uses and demands on the river, we get a lot of mail from, from uh, patrons and, and stakeholders within the basin. Um, I've literally had boxes of it sent to me where people complaining they want us to vote one way to not allow New York City to hold this much water, and then the other box might say, we want you to release more water for fisheries or for whitewater rafting, whatever it might be. So uh, this is a picture of some of my other peers uh, from the decree parties. Um, we have these public forums, we have listening sessions and outreach, and we try to listen to what people are, are telling us and what their interests are. And like I said, it's very common to have one person come up and talk in the microphone and say, please release more water during the summer and the next person will come up. No, please hold more water back. So it's it's difficult to try to meet the demands and have the public understand that our role as defined by the Supreme Court is just to deal with water transfers and how much New York City can release dealing with water management for water supply. However, 
we did sign a new agreement. This is the, what we call the Flexible Flow Management Plan. And that was signed in uh, October of 2017 after a lot of negotiations for many years. We came to an agreement on ways that we can have some flexibility. For example, we can hold back some water at certain times to use that bank of water for the fisheries, even though it's not uh, part of the, the initial charge or the, or the reason why those reservoirs were built. I think in good faith, we're trying to, to appease or, or meet the needs of various users on the uh, um, river. There's also going to be a study looking at New York City's detachment from the salt front. That means how much water they have to release to push the salt front down. There's some other ways that we might be able to get storage lower in the basin that could offset that. We're going to include sea level rise modeling and scenarios going forward. We have a lot of computer models that kind of simulate the water in the Delaware River Basin. This was a big deal to Delaware and something we pushed for in the agreement. So we're going to look at storage capacity below and how we calculate the excess release quantity. That's kind of this bank of water that we're kind of deciding to spread around for various other uses. And um, New York City is also agreeing to increase more voids during critical times that might mitigate flooding like uh, this time of year. And, and um, New Jersey also agreed to reduce its diversion during times of drought emergency slightly. So anyway, we have some studies going on that are part of this FFMP agreement that we wanted to uh, work with some of our uh, colleagues that are in some of the scientific groups. And in some cases, uh, studies have been supported to help us get answers so we can go forth with our agreement and kind of refine that and upgrade that because we do have a five and 10 year timeline to make some more decisions. This is a a graphic made by the Delaware River Basin Commission. They do some modeling and they're looking at some of the saltwater intrusions. Uh, on this graphic here, the red is uh, kind of the area that's saltier water. This is down by the bay and this is kind of looking up north, the northern part of the bay and the blue water is fresher. And it's actually a uh, animation and I'll show it to you if it works. But here what you're looking at is how when the tide comes in, it sloshes and pushes the saltwater up and then it retreats when the tide goes back out. Here is the gauge that shows that we had a lot of fresh water coming in during a storm. And so you can see the water actually comes up higher during that time and then goes back down. So we have a lot of tools now that can really help us to understand the dynamics of the river and what some of the best ways we can do to manage the salinity at the same time, keeping ecosystems protected and, and other concerns. Um, another study that's going on is the U.S. Geological Survey has started a new program called the Next Generation Water Observing System, and they are looking at major basins around the United States, and they've kind of got this holistic way of studying and monitoring these river basins. And by luck and with a little help of the power of suggestion, the Delaware River was chosen as the first river uh, basin to be studied. Basically, the USGS is adding additional stream gauges. They're doing remote sensing. They're using some of those autonomous vehicles and drones to collect data within the river. We're looking at groundwater for the first time and how that integrates with the surface water. And this should be really valuable data once again to help us with our next agreement that we'll have to come uh, forward with to uh, manage the water in the river. And as we come to the close, I'd like to make some acknowledgments uh, first to Stephanie Baxter, who works at the Delaware Geological Survey with me. Stephanie's kind of my technical uh, assistant and helps with uh, working on some of the work groups and, and share our opinions from Delaware's perspective with our peers. Uh, New York City Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Paul Rush, who was a deputy commissioner, was very gracious in providing me some of the slides and access to the tunnels and some tours there, which I find very interesting and, and just an amazing uh, feat of engineering to get the water down in New York City. Uh, the Office of the Delaware River Master and my decree party principal peers, and also the Delaware River Basin Commission, which is, does a lot of work in the basin and provides other decree parties with uh, valuable information. And that's the end of my talk. And now I guess we have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a great talk. We're going to go ahead and open the floor for questions now. I'll go ahead and get us started with a question, and this might answer one of the questions I see in the chat as well. So could you talk a little bit more about the geology coming into play for 
reconstructing that portion of the tunnel that runs through limestone and what's different geologically about the new position of the tunnel or is the new construction mainly focused on updating the engineering aspects of the tunnel there? Um, those are, that's a very good question. Uh, they're basically going to be putting the, the new tunnel, in, it's in the same type of geology, but of course, you know, they have uh, a better understanding of what's going on and um, can hopefully make the tunnel maybe a little more robust going forward. But one thing I failed to mention, I think, in my original uh, presentation is that that diversion tunnel going around will allow them to move water around the main stem of the tunnel right now that's going to be repaired. And then ultimately, ultimately, when that section has been repaired, they will now have two tunnel options in this area where the geology is somewhat unstable. So, for example, if one of those sections started to leak or have problems again, they can just switch it to the other and kind of bypass that section while they drain water out and do repairs. So they kind of have a redundancy going through this area where the, the geology is a little bit um, more unstable for, for the longevity of a tunnel of this size. Thanks for that, David. Okay, um, so I see our next question is, uh, what other measures has New York taken to reduce water demand? If you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't claim to be a, an expert on all of what New York City has been done from their management side. Uh, you know, like I said, I, the slides I used here were shared by a colleague. Um, but, I, you know, I do know that they've done a lot of infrastructure repair on, you know, water lines in the city, not only the the low pressure or, or you know, high efficiency toilets, but just water lines themselves, you know, in any given town, wherever you live right now, I can pretty much guarantee you the water lines are probably leaking. Uh, the idea is as long as the pressure is positive, in other words, there's enough pressure through the line, the water is moving out, it's it's not much of a threat of contamination if, if the pressure reduces and water can flow into the pipes, then, then you have an issue. So uh, all pipes as they age start to leak. And I know they've done, you know, a lot of their main uh, infrastructure in some of these places, you know, they, they may have existed for 100 years. And um, for example, we, we probably all heard of the, the problems in Flint, Michigan, where, you know, they had the, the lead poisoning and other things. A lot of that, that water infrastructure is very, very old and, and needed to be replaced. And that's true around the country and, and as well as New York City. And probably lastly, the other way you can conserve water is through price. As we know, we our water bills go up and to pay for that infrastructure and things, you know, I'm sure the costs have gone up over time, which also forces people to conserve water and be a little bit more thoughtful in how they use it. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, how are nitrate concentrations in water coming from the Catskill region? Uh, I don't know that um, off the top of my head. I've not seen much of the raw water chemistry, but I can tell you that those reservoirs have huge uh, riparian zones, which are areas that are left in a natural state where you have, you know, woodland and whatever uh, along the, the shores of these lakes, and they're pretty much protected. You know, folks can't, uh, in some areas go in easily. And so that tends to do a lot of natural filtration of, you know, uh, some of the pollutants or natural pollutants and things. So uh, the water quality is very, very high in uh, those lakes. I can tell you that. I'm not sure exactly what the nitrate numbers are. Okay, that was great. Thank you. Another question is, what is the anticipated lifespan of the current tunnel um, as well as the lifespan of the new tunnel section? That I don't know off the top of my head. You know, I, I like I said, the tunnel was, you know, started um, in the 30s. So, you know, we're already looking at, you know, 80, 90 years it's been operating until it's gotten to the point where we've had some leakage that's uh, problematic such that it needs to be repaired. But, um, you know, uh, the price tags of, of this repair, I know, is in the billions of dollars. So, you know, I, I'm sure it's it's being planned for several decades of, of use uh, 
before it might have to be replaced or repaired again. Okay, thanks for that. And I see Rick has asked here, is there an individual river master? And if so, how is that person selected? I don't know if you're able to uh, yeah, kind of there, touch on that question. There is a person who has that title. Uh, it used to be, and I think the original legislation, it was the the chief hydrologist or some some similar title to that. Uh, that that was a position they maintained. But you know, over the years, that I think the change the titles have changed name but there's actually a, a person who's recruited and hired you know usually with a lot of you know hydro hydrology background that uh, is, is has the title of river master and they have uh roughly two to four staff that work underneath them that are out collecting field data and, and kind of maintaining a an office that's actually up in upstate new york or in pennsylvania um is basically where they work and uh collect raw data, you know, day to day. All right, thank you for that. And I see Greg has asked, uh, what about climate change? Um, so maybe I'll just expand on, um, are there any uh, long term or plans in the future that have been discussed about um, related to these water supply issues? Well, I think climate change is on the, the radar of everyone involved here, all of my, you know, peers from the various states. Uh, New York City, you know, puts a lot of resources into managing this water supply, as you would imagine, because of the investment and, and its critical uh, need for providing the water for this large city. But they have models where they're actually, um, you know, looking at precipitation uh, um, forecasts that go out, you know, quite a bit into the future. They also have a, a snow monitoring system so they can measure how much snowpack is, you know, stored up in the valley after the winter because that ultimately melts. Then, you know, can, you know, flow into the reservoirs and provide some base flow to them. So, you know, it's 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 quite intricate for as large as, as it is. And, and, you know, we know that the snow patterns, for example, and precipitation patterns are are likely to change as we go forward. And I think they are they are planning and that's all being integrated in, in the modeling that they do to kind of project how much water might be in these reservoirs, you know, sometimes several months in advance. We know it's hard to model the weather that far out, but, um, you know, I, I think our tools are getting better and, and having some idea is better than none at all. And uh, so, you know, all these constraints, and of course, as I mentioned in my talk, Sea level rise, which could you know bring saltier water up uh, a few feet higher ultimately in you know the next century or so, and that could affect how much salt goes into the the bay and then ultimately intakes or, or other people that are you know withdrawing fresh water or, or slightly brackish, for example, uh, in the bay. And so I think uh, there's a lot of varying groups that are looking at all of these scenarios uh, going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. And there's time for one more question. Um, you mentioned the Queens well field as a temporary stopgap. Are any Delaware large cities or other East Coast cities supplied by groundwater? Are there sufficient aquifers? Yeah, in Delaware, for example, uh, the majority of um, the northern part of the state, kind of north of the uh, canal uh, is typically uh, surface water. We have some surface water reservoirs that were built. Uh, there's actually an, uh, an interesting setup with one of the uh, water companies there actually has an inflatable dam where they can raise this dam up. It's only a few feet tall, but it can keep salt water at different times uh, when you know we may not have a lot of uh, rain water or fresh water flowing down the river. And they can actually kind of separate that off from the main stem of the Christiana River and and uh, pull their water supply from that. So there are some innovative ways that, that we've used that to control surface water here in northern Delaware. And then as you go south of the canal, it's mainly groundwater. It's like 90% of the pop of the uh, water supply, and that's for agriculture as well as small towns. So it, so it changes, you know, kind of based on the the geography and the geomorphology of the state. 
and I know it's similar in, in uh, New Jersey across the uh, bay. You know, there's a lot of agriculture in southern Jersey as well. And that's mainly groundwater is the source of water for irrigation. All right. Thank you for that answer. Okay, well, that's about all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent questions. And thank you, David, for presenting today. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much, David, for sharing your time, expertise, and insights with us.